Hello lovely people, welcome to another episode of Book Chat, the weekly roundup of stuff I've read at some point in the past. I've got five books to talk about this week and I'm just going to dive into it. I'm going to kick things off with a bit of a chunky boy. This is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. Um, this is a very famous book. I know a lot of people have read it. I know a lot of people have loved it. My friend lent this to me. Um, my friend's at the Institute of History. Um, and this was the perfect thing that I needed to read at the time that I read it. So um, this essentially is Tudor history, but it's following Thomas Cromwell, which I found a really refreshing sort of focus. I've read quite a lot of Tudor historical fiction by now, especially when I was younger, and it is always interesting to read it from a perspective that's slightly different from some of the more common perspectives you get, and that's not bashing those perspectives, it's just like um, a period of history that has been so intensely focused on how do you go about doing it in a slightly different way. Oftentimes it's who is our lens focused on. Um, so this follows Thomas Cromwell um, from childhood up until um, when this book ends. I'm not going to tell you when this book ends, <laughs> but it's the first part of a trilogy. Um, and it's a chunky little boy, and I had a really good time reading it because um, I was a little bit stressed reading it during the time period that I read this. And the the comforting familiarity of Tudor times was, I think, something I needed. I was struggling to get into books a little bit, and this, I think, made it easier for me to get into this. But also, the way the story was told was different and exciting enough that I was, like, um, hooked and intrigued. So this does a lot of um, flashing back and forward across times, so, like, um, it's not just like following him like from childhood to now. It's like, okay, we're like at this place and now we're gonna flash back and do a little bit of a thing here and now we're at this point and then maybe we might like flash back and do a little bit of a thing here. So there's like a lot of like um chopping and changing between timelines. And I actually really enjoyed that because I do have quite a solid foundation of Tudor knowledge. I think maybe if you're someone who's not so familiar with Tudor history, so you're not so familiar with the people um, and like what actually happened that might be a bit harder for some people to engage with because you might end up feeling a lot more lost um, whereas I didn't have that because I when people were popping up I already knew who the people were so I, I didn't feel as lost um, one of the narrative sort of mechanisms she does which again was occasionally a bit confusing um, was using um, he specifically to refer to Cromwell it took me a while to realise she'll do like um, sometimes the speech isn't in ex isn't in quotation marks and sometimes it is, um, but then also um, during like conversations, um, it took me a while to twig on that if the convers if like someone says something and it's like blah 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 he said he is Cromwell. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time she just doesn't refer to him as Cromwell and um, that was occasionally confusing because occasionally in conversations before I was like okay if it's he unless she specifies otherwise it's Cromwell speaking I would be like who said this did so and so say this and I would I would t think it was someone else talking so that's just a thing to be aware of if you're interested in this book like just <laughs> just occasionally caught me out and I was like what is going on but on the whole, I actually really enjoyed reading this. Um, I thought she did a really great job of like um, world building. Like there were so many details in this about like what physically like what is this place like? What are like the smells like? What is like rushes on the floor? Blah blah blah, which is really great, especially because this copy, which is my friend's copy, has um, lots of highlighted stuff because my friend is a writer who is writing her own. Um, novel set in Tudor times, so I think a lot of the highlighting in this um, really drew my attention to those aspects of world building detail because those are things which she's highlighted for herself as like a reference point of like what are like what is Tudor times like what are like those defining things that are just like everyday stuff that you could use to flesh out the authenticity of your tale um, that aspect really <laughs> highlighted that in here for me um, yes, I will be continuing this series at some point. I'm going to take a break and read some books that I physically own because I'm trying not to buy books at the moment. 
Um, but on the whole, um, I had a really great time reading this. It was everything that I kind of needed at the time. And this was just like the perfect book for me to like sink into at the moment that I was reading it. And I really appreciated that. Moving on to something completely different. I also read a book on my Kindle and that is Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett. I think this is the 19th book in the Discworld series. I've been, um, I have read other Discworld books previously, but I have specifically been working my way through in chronological publishing order for a while now. So I think this is my 19th in chronological order. Um, Feet of Clay is um, a Night Watch book, so it focuses on um, Vimes and the people within the Night Watch. I, again, this was another book which was everything I needed at the time. Just for context, this is being filmed in the final week of March, and as I'm sure you'll remember, March has been a time, and I have struggled to get into reading slightly, um, but now I've identified the types of things I want to be reading, I'm having much more success, which is great. Um, see, I wanted to read a Terry Pratchett because I wanted that um, light-hearted, humorous sort of usually riffing off of genre type thing. I was craving that. Feet of Clay turned out to be like everything I wanted and more. So this is following the Night Watch. Um, essentially there's a couple, there's been a couple of murders. Um, someone has also attempted to poison the patrician and Vines and his team are sort of like looking into this and what's happened. Um, one thing that is a big theme in this book is golems and golems as a way of discussing like um, what makes a person a person, like how there's this whole, you know, like golems are a created thing, so to the larger disc society golems are like, they're not people, they're things, they do what you tell them to do, and they're just things, they don't have rights, they don't need breaks, stuff like that. Whereas there's a whole discussion in this of like, when does a thing become a person? What makes you like a being that is like entitled to things and stuff? And I just, I absolutely loved it. I had such a good time. On like the lighter end of the spectrum, this is so riffing off of like detective-y mystery genre, um, try, especially like Vimes trying to solve who's poisoned the patrician is so like, trying to like put together these clues stuff like that there's also a deeper focus on like the supernatural entity side so like werewolves and vampires and other supernatural things are becoming a little bit more of a presence which i'm excited to hopefully explore more of in future books um and just like i just it was everything that i needed it was peak Pratchett for me, whereby you have, um, here we are playing with a genre, being lighthearted and silly, but also making some really valid points and really analysing, like, how people treat other people and how people treat people who they don't consider people, um, both in terms of golems, but also in terms of, like, supernatural people, stuff like that. So, like, I just, <laughs> again, everything I needed it to be at the time that I read it, which was really great. I also read a fantasy book recently, which was The Red Wyvern by Catherine Kerr. This is book one of the Dragon Mage um, series, however this is also in the overarching Devery series. I've mentioned the Devery series a number of times. Um, it's a very, it's a really interesting fantasy series, so Catherine Kerr's Devery series um, has um, Reincarnation is sort of like a topic in this. This book starts off in one timeline as an introduction. We then spend most of this narrative flashing back to an earlier time period where um, a number of the figures are in one of their different incarnations. And then where this ends, it then returns to that first, I hit myself in the nose, yes. <laughs> it then returns to that first timeline. And there are a lot more implications for how this timeline is gonna play out now that I know more of the backstory. So the Devery Cycle, you could technically pick this one up and start reading from here. I think you miss a lot of extra nuance from having not read the previous eight books in this series. So technically this is the first book in a four book series, but I really think these benefit from being read in their entirety, which is what I have been doing. Because as a child, I read this one and only this cycle, despite owning earlier cycles, and things did not make 100% sense, whereas they do now. Um, I got a little bit tired with the second series. 
So the first cycle of four books I really loved. The second cycle of four books I occasionally got frustrated with. And one of the main things that bothered me in the final book of that, I was much more interested in one of the other sets of characters which we weren't exploring fully. Whereas this book explores those characters more fully and we're really building up more of a plot line and I'm really enjoying it. Um, dragons will become more of a thing as this cycle goes on. They were only really introduced at the end of the last four books, so I'm really excited for dragons to become more of a focus. And I'm just thoroughly enjoying. One of the things, again, which I felt about the second cycle was that the past lives had less relevance. The first cycle was all about um, seeing how this one particular early timeline had such ramifications for all the bonds, for all of these people who were involved, and how in all of their other reincarnations they're constantly um, they're, they don't rem you don't remember your past lives apart from if you're like very gifted in Deoma and stuff like this, but um, you could just see all of the ramifications continue to play out like uh, people who did bad things have that weaved further and that sort of thing whereas that second cycle it didn't feel quite so relevant whereas now into this new third cycle you really are seeing the way that how certain people interacting can have such repercussions when they're reincarnated later down the line and sometimes that's for good and oftentimes that is for bad but also sometimes it is for good and good changes happen so um, this has kind of reinvigorated my enjoyment of this series. I think I got a little fatigued with it on book eight, but actually now that we're back on book nine, I'm really excited to continue this book, this series further. So you will be seeing these pop up in some book chats in the future again. Um, moving on to some short stories, I also read A Portable Shelter by Kirsty Logan. First of all, this is a gorgeous edition. <laughs> um, this kind of felt to me a little bit like Isabel Greenberg's A Hundred Nights of Hero meets Lucy Wood's Diving Bells short story collections. So um, the setup is that there's these two um, women who are a couple, and one of them is pregnant with a baby, and the women have made this agreement to never lie to each other. So when one of the other ones isn't there, or like in cases the pregnant woman is asleep, <laughs> um, they take it in turns to like tell their baby stories but they're stories that they don't want the other person to hear and a lot of the stories it's about like giving the baby life lessons and stuff. Um, I absolutely loved the concept of this book. A number of the short stories didn't quite work for me but I think that's kind of, that's how I feel about a lot of short story collections. So there were a handful of these that I was just not bothered about but there were a number that I actually did really enjoy. Um, I could draw a comparison with Lucy Wood's Diving Bells because Diving Bells was exploring Cornish mythology and a lot of those short stories there was sort of kind of like an openness about them in many ways. You weren't always necessarily getting such like a resolution it was just like here is a story, here is part of a tale and there are a number of these that felt that way to me. My favourite ones were ones that sort of drew on that kind of like there was one about cell keys which I really love and um, there was another one that was like riffing off of Bluebeard a little bit stuff like that so um, there were some stories in this that I particularly cherished there were a number of stories in this that I wasn't super fussed about so I gave it a three out of five stars because that's like my usual rounded off short story collection rating however this one I will be keeping because I think that some of those ones that I really liked I would like to reread which I don't I normally get rid of a lot of my short story collections I give them away to charity shops so like hey that's a good that's a good indictment um, finally, I'm just going to end on a non-fiction book. This is How Music Works by David Byrne, he of the Talking Heads fame. This is both a discussion of how music practically works, both from like a actual like creating music level, all the way through to like, so you get a record deal, so you want to record, how do those things actually work? But then also there's a heavy amount of this which is also kind of like David Byrne telling you a lot about his own experiences of recording, especially with like Talking Heads and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm not the biggest Talking Heads fan, I'm not the biggest fan of David Byrne's music, I like some Talking Heads songs, I just don't really know them super well. Um, it was interesting to learn about how the band sort of came into being and then like he's done so many different types of music. Like one thing I will say for him is he seems to have such like a a broad platform of music that he draws on like almost like globally geographically like he's going all over the place with like the types of music that inspire him that he works with and stuff like that so that was quite interesting also like just genuinely interesting to learn a lot specifically about like um 
the first chapter which is about how music actually like works like how creating music like um like that sort of thing was interesting um i also actually found it really interesting about like so what are the different types of um contracts you have in like the recording industry what are the different types of like um when it comes to doing like uh, album promotion and also like recording your albums and stuff like that i was kind of less interested in like the development of like records became cds became blah because i kind of I, like, I kind of understood the basic gist i don't know that wasn't quite as interesting but on the whole this was interesting um i probably you know sometimes you read non-fiction books and you're like there's no way i'm going to remember all of this information <laughs> so i'm really glad i read it because it was interesting i could not repeat back to you probably 70 percent of what he actually said because a lot of it was just like i was like this is interesting i'm not going to remember it <laughs> but that's also me because i have a terrible memory but hey um, those are all the books I wanted to talk about this week. As per usual, I would love to hear any thoughts you have on these down in the comments down below. Um, otherwise, I hope you're having the loveliest of days, and I'll see you next time for something different.